you're this musician, like I said before, that work in an agency, and all of a mm. sudden you're selling your company to one of the big players. Big commerce is interested in the solution that we're making. How did that happen? I think it was just inevitability, right? Okay. Uh, we have been pushing big commerce in the direction of B2B since before big commerce realized they could do B2B. And we had done that um, you know, for so long. I think everybody at big commerce kind of knew that this was going to be the solution, right? It's very difficult to teach to teach a, a new system, especially when something's already working. So, um, you know, but one, sometimes, one, sorry, one, Nidura, but sometimes B two B solutions are like uh, what the Uber is to taxis, right? For sales rep, they feel threatened by it, right? How how, how do we true. make them play together? If the sales reps see the e commerce as a competition, likely you know, they're, they're going to have a tough time. There's not a lot of businesses in the next 10 years that won't have an e-commerce presence for B2B. Let me challenge you there. Isn't it too much 10 years to talk about that? Shouldn't be yeah, we're talking about maybe three years. Yeah, 10 years is too far. Yeah, three years we don't even know, right? Yeah, exactly. I think where the market is really going to open up is when you have these like manufacturers that are like, wow, like we get good SEO now, we get inquiries from people that we've never even thought we would reach before. And now we can go into new international markets and sell, you know, to all of these mom and pops in a way that's profitable. Hello, everybody. How are you? Welcome to another episode of The Link e-commerce connections and I'm really happy today with uh, with the topic that we're going to touch on it's um, it's basically about how a musician how a music producer uh, it's transforming the B2B uh, environment the B2B scenario with a product that he, he built so hello Alec how are you hey Diego doing very well Cool. So everybody, um, Alec Berkeley, he is uh, director and business develop uh, from business development for the B two B department in Big Commerce. Is that correct, Alec? Yeah. Yep. Yeah, I oversee the B two B pod, is what we call it. Yeah. But like I said, you're a music musician that made a, a very particular journey to be where you are right now. Can you give us a little bit of uh, that story? Can you tell us that story of how you became uh, a B2B expert that are literally changing how the B2B e-commerce is uh, solving the new problems that we have, uh, I would say, post-COVID? Sure. Um, yeah, so I guess it started uh, back in 2015. I joined a digital agency that was a Magento. At that time, it was a gold partner. Of Magento, and we had built some uh, extensions for for merchants that wanted to do business to business online. At that time, it was not very popular to to do B two B online. Most of it existed uh, over the phone, fax, email, stuff like that. Um, so so having having built some of those solutions, we uh, we we built we built that business, and then realized okay, there's software as a service now. Shopify and Big Commerce, they were the two players that, that were around in 2016, 2017. Uh, we spoke to both of them about the kinds of things we were doing on the Magento platform. We, uh, we felt that the Big Commerce platform was a better fit for us strategically to, to, to then kind of partner and, and build more uh, cost effective solutions. Same kind of features. Even today, it's, it's still the same types of features back from 2015. But now it's at a much much lower lower cost for the merchant. So we had we had partnered with Big Commerce as an agency, uh, got around 20, 30 customers that that were doing B two B, transitioned into the technology side. So started another company, Bundle B two B, that that grew through the technology program, and then um, yeah, once COVID hit, we went from 60 customers to uh, 350 within a couple of years. So. Huge. That, that growth was because we were already there doing the, the B2B. It's not rocket science. Like we, we were really doing the same thing for years before COVID happened. It's just that we were already there and what we were offering was at a very good price and it was, it was quick. It was quick to, to launch as well. 
So I think that's why we got the growth that we did, and then Big Commerce purchased us, and now we're about two months in post acquisition, trying to do the full integration of, of bundle B two B into the core of uh, Big Commerce. And tell me, Ali, how, what what was it that you identified back back then when when you started Bundle B two B that you said, okay, here's a huge opportunity, right? Like let's focus because you told me you built another company to do that. What was What was the, the, the main indicators that told you, okay, yeah, we need to go this, this route? Yeah, I think we realized that these customers were underserved, right? Because they were paying a lot of money for something that was not proven yet. And uh, also probably didn't need to be spending so much money on. It's like, uh, you know, three, four thousand a month maintenance costs just for uh, uh, online catalog in some cases for sales reps to go and, you know, interact with customers. So um, I think the opportunity was the market was underserved and there was also the complexity of integration that I think a lot of uh, a lot of businesses require integration before they go online. And if you understand that, how how to integrate their their back office with with online, that's going to allow them to actually be successful. So I think whether we, we weren't actually doing the integration ourselves, but we were partnering with companies that could do it. So we, we basically said, you know, look, here's the front end, here's your back end. We know how to, uh, you know, bridge those two together and get you to be successful online. And kind of telling that whole story, I think that was what allowed us to, to push through. Was, and it's not that it was free to do the integration either. It's that we were able to guide them down the right path to be successful in that. And I think um, that was what allowed us to be successful. So you, you were basically uh, identifying patterns in, in all of this Magento customers first, and B two B commerce, um, e commerce uh, merchants. What was what were those patterns? That what what were the the, the shared problems ap apart from the integration? What 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 was the functionality or the features that they were needing? And they like you said, they were underserved. Yeah. So for example, um, if I'm a buyer, I want to see my uh, statement of account. So I want to know what my open balances relative to my credit limit to see if I can, you know, place more orders that month or if I have to make payments. So just to check account information, it, it is quite a manual process for a lot of businesses, right? Yeah. So one is you get real time visibility into your statement of account. Uh, that's more, more on the finance side. But if you if you look at from just the procurement side of things ordering, a lot of times these buyers are ordering the same types of things all the time. So re so reordering and making that process of doing lots of orders with hundreds of line items, um, you know, we, we built some tools like the shopping list and the quick order pad and the buy again that made made that that process less clicks and you know, effect, like allowing the buyers to to spend more time doing other things, not just going and finding products on a website or, or calling on the phone and. You know, placing the same order again. <laughs> yeah. You know, talking about you know who knows what half the time, the other half the time. You know, ordering, right? <laughs> and, and tell me something. It's very interesting what you're saying because, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but from what I'm hearing, you solved a very complex technical problem by focusing on the user experience, right? Mm -hmm. You saw mm -hmm. like what what were the the customers of your customers needing, and you just mm -hmm. went on to solve that problem without getting uh, too complicated, right? At least at the beginning, I would guess. Yeah, totally. I mean, yeah, we did bootstrap it, right? So from the first customer, we we wanted everything. We wanted to know everything that their buyers were looking for, everything they were looking for to make their business more efficient. And, you know, that's how we built the first iteration was just by solving one customer's problems. And then you get the second and the third and the fourth. And then you start seeing the, the common themes. And then ultimately where we got i think was about 80% of the most commonly requested features functionality for you know manufacturers distributors that use you know back office a b or c going into e-commerce platform x y and z they're going to need these tools to be successful right and that was where eventually we landed many many iterations and some failures later right so um, you know we did have some failed projects right <laughs> not everything yeah, was imagine. a success so um, you know I'm sure that there's customers out there that, uh, you know, were a little early to the party and then others that are here now should be thanking those customers <laughs> that were, that yeah, were yeah. there early. That have the, the arrows on their back, right? 
Exactly. Yeah, you should be thanking them. Yeah, <laughs> paving the way. And and uh, and tell me, how does the B two B space changed in such little, uh, such small time frame, from sixty to three hundred and fifty? What what was the? Of course, COVID. Mm -hmm. But what what uh, happened with COVID? How how did COVID impact um, B two the B two B space? to accelerate that change so, so much? Yeah, I think a lot of it is the consumer demands changed, right? You know, the evolution of Amazon, like what, what happens now if something gets to your house in three days, not yeah. two, like you're, you're upset about it, right? Exactly, <laughs> if it, yeah. you, know, if you're, you're, you know, if you're shipping and billing address, you have to re-input it manually or something. You're like, oh man, like, why do I have to spend time doing this? Right? So, I think the consumer uh, expectations, because everyone now, I mean, I say everyone, I think over 90% probably of, of people that have made it through COVID have had to now purchase something online and gone through that process. And then in their day jobs, right, in, in, in uh, you know, B2B procurement, you know, purchasing goods, they want that same type of experience, uh, easy, easy to, to purchase experience, not having to go through some kind of... Uh, iframe that looks yeah. like it was built in 1998 right but it so. was it was also a, kind of the mindset because uh we've been in in this space for for a long time as well and and we heard one time and again that uh merchants would expect that their customers are different for b2b than for b2c so it, they, they would try to convince themselves yeah the experience uh shouldn't be as good as b2c they're not expecting that and all this that happened prove it wrong, right? And they, they're expecting a, a B2C experience in a B2B space. They're the same exactly. people buying, right? It's the same people, yeah. So <laughs> um, I think that the added features, like what we talked about before, those are needed, right? You need to have some bulk ordering capability, reordering capability, some uh, shared visibility. So if you and I belong to the same company, you know, we need to see what each other are doing in case, you know, I'm out this week, you were there last week, I could see what you ordered. So I can now reorder that. So, you know, with with some changes, but it's not that much different than in an Amazon family account, right? We are yeah. all ordering the, you know, the paper towels and the wipes and everything else, you know, okay, I see this is what, you know, we bought last week, I'll go buy it this week, right? It's somewhat uh, adjacent to that, but of course with special pricing, you know, pay on account, functionality, stuff like that, which which does introduce that complexity, which at that point it's no longer just about the user experience, it's about, okay, post order, you know, what's the process and, and how can we make that more efficient? That's really, you know, where I think, you can't just send it off to, you know, a 3PL and drop ship every time, sometimes, there's back orders. You have to check, you know, sometimes distributors, they have to order things from many different places to, to fulfill an order. Um, so, so helping the customers, uh, help, helping the merchants, um, you know, on the back office side and integrating over there. Um, un again, understanding that is really important because, you know, we really love to talk about e-commerce and all the great things you can do from the user experience perspective. But to a lot of these merchants, that doesn't mean anything. <laughs> exactly. There's a lot <laughs> and, going on in the back end, right? Exactly. Lots of and workflows. If they, can't see, if they can't see how the whole picture is going to work, right? So that's why I think everyone that's been successful in the last five, 10 years has a holistic view and understanding of that, not just on the user experience side. All right, the order is placed. That's great. You know, they right. were able to do it in two clicks, right? Well, and now that you're mentioning, the, of course, the merchants, right? And we're going to go deeper uh, more in the, in the benefits and how... Uh, Actually, the merchants see that their lives are, are improved by tools such as uh, Bundle B2B and, and, and Big Commerce. Mm -hmm. But um, um, I, I would like to, to understand also how is it that you um, see the, 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 the adoption of the different uh, features that you offer, right? And, and, and the reason I'm asking this is because we see very frequently that one thing is to implement a new technology but the most difficult part of it is the adoption right mm -hmm. so so how how does uh, your solution help companies ad, uh, adopt adopt the tool and, and also in the in this environment that things change like very very fast right and they need to um, not just adopt a new platform but maybe adopt different processes within the company 
That's true. It is very difficult because um, teaching, uh, particularly for the sales reps, um, <laughs> this is not a dig on sales reps. I've, I'm in sales myself. Um, it, it's very difficult to teach to teach a, a new system, especially when something's already working. So, um, you know, but one, sometimes one, sorry to interrupt, but sometimes B two B solutions are like uh, what the Uber is to taxis, right? For sales rep, they feel threatened by it, right? How how, how do true. we make them play together? Yeah, some of it comes from just management, right? So, um, at a, if the CEO is is you know getting on a call with the full sales team saying it's it's this way going forward if you're not behind that then you know find another company that's one way to do it right um not usually the case though so i think what ends up happening is you have um you know a couple of sales reps um that that start to test the system use the system provide feedback to the e-commerce team the development team so even if <laughs> Even if you think it's perfect, it's not perfect. Yeah. So the sales reps always going to have some feedback there, and and if you can push through that feedback, like the things that um, maybe not everything they say they need, they do need, but some things they actually do need. So if you can find that, you know, that gap, it's the same thing as like when you're a developer, you're looking at an RFQ, and you say, all right, here's your phase one, here's your phase two, phase three. You have to phase it out for your internal team as well because it's not just going to cut over. So, um, you know, ideally you have like a recorded walkthrough of, you know, the, the e-commerce managers, not your sales rep, the e-commerce manager who's in charge of that, you know, going in and through the quote process or masquerading as a customer or, you know, doing these different workflows and explaining to the sales rep, look, now instead of managing five accounts, you have the ability to transition, you know, all of your accounts to self-service and maybe just focus on those five accounts that you have, uh, you know, on the phone, right? Yeah. So you, you can still call up your buddies that are bringing in a lot of revenue. And then everybody else that's under this amount, you can transition them to self-service. They can call you if they want to know, you know, how you're doing and everything. But don't call me for an order, exactly. right? Or don't call me for a quote, right? Um, I can do that through the website. Uh, or call me that you need a quote and then I'll send it to you, you know, through, through the website. So I think... Um, that that's some of it is generational um and then i think other yeah. components are more how you run your business and you know if the sales reps see the e-commerce as a competition likely you know they're they're going to have a tough time there's not a lot of businesses in the next 10 years that won't have an e-commerce presence for b2b um, you know there's channel conflict in some businesses so there's probably you know, going to be a subset of reps that can get away with never using a website in the next 10 years because, you know, there's no direct sales or, or sales through the website. And maybe they have a big deal with Target or Sorry, is, is, isn't it? Um, let me challenge you there. Isn't it too much 10 years to talk about that? Shouldn't be yeah, we're talking far. about maybe three years. Yeah, 10 years is far. Yeah, three years, we don't even know, right? Yeah, exactly. But um, yeah, I think what happens with, with the large with the large uh, customers, like a sales rep could land like a big box retailer, then they'll they'll do the orders through like uh, EDI, right? Yeah. Because like say like Target or Home Depot, Home Depot they'll purchase through uh, procurement system, and that procurement system can either create the order through e-commerce called Punch Out, and then we we put it down into ERP, or they could use um, you know an EDI middleware tool that can go directly from the procurement system to the ERP. So. Technically, if a sales rep oversees those EDI accounts, they could not touch e-commerce and they, they could still be very profitable accounts for them. So, I mean, that scenario might, it will still exist. EDI is a very, very old technology, but yeah. I don't think, I would venture to say it's not going to be leaving us anytime soon because there's such high volume of, of transactions, large companies using, yeah. using this method. Yeah, actually changing those systems would will require a lot of efforts, money, time, uh, totally. error fixing. I would, I would guess lots of error fixing. Yeah. There. Yeah. And, and uh, tell me a little bit more about the, the, the features, the core features that a B2B site should have. Mm -hmm. And what are the benefits for the merchant? And what are the benefits for the buyer of their, that merchant? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So 
so the core features, what it really comes down to is the business account structure itself. Everything revolves around what we call like the company object, right? An ERP system might call it a customer and then the users within that might be called yeah. contacts. But within our world, it's company and users. And then you can have additional kind of data points that, that you can attach to that in the ERP, you call those user defined fields. And, and, you know, for here, those are just custom fields, right? So once you've created that object, um, for, for the company, um, you can then have, you know, your bill to ship to user management. So hierarchy, so junior buyer, senior buyer, admin, super admin, these are all different roles that can do different things, carry out different actions on the site. Um, so being able to just structure what you would have in your ERP online, replicate that data model, that's very valuable for both the merchant and for the customer. Um, now, in terms of the front end features themselves, um, you know, you've got the ability for a user to request a quote, whether that's I found your website online and, you know, I want to I want to see what it would be to get pricing for this product in bulk. I can request a quote for that. So that's lead. Um, also, the ability to apply to become a wholesale account. Um, if I see that there's a wholesale program, I'm a wholesaler. And I like your products. I've ordered them before. And now I want to become a trade customer. Right. So that's another way of generating a lead. Um, so that's valuable for the merchant, right? So all, all things valuable for the merchant. And then for the, for the customer, I, once I fill out that application, I can then get that approved, assigned pricing, as well as access to all of the uh, user management features to add additional buyers now underneath me. And once we start putting in those orders, then you, you get access to the reordering functionality as well. Um, and what's also cool is that if I'm a merchant, I could do all this on behalf of my customer. So say I have a customer, they're not technical at all. I could have a sales rep go in, fill out the application on behalf of my customer, approve it. They could assign themselves as the rep, go and masquerade, create their first order, and then say, all right, customer, your, your order has already been created. You can go log in. I created an account for you. All you have to do now from here is just keep reordering or okay. modifying that order, right? So, so you, lo the you lower the, the, the bar for, for the customer the so they can segue yeah. into start purchasing uh, from you. On both right? sides, yeah. On on both that's sides. a good way of putting it. On both sides, you want to lower the barrier to entry to do business online, right? So even if I'm just starting, you don't have to bring your whole B2B business online. That's something yeah. that I always tell our, our customers. You don't or do, have to or do it, it in online. phases, right? Because exactly, you can bring just two customers online. Exactly. I'll be happy, right? Exactly. And if they're happy, then most likely other customers will be, and then you can you can get more of that revenue flowing through the self service. And, and what's the and what's the uh, the size of the market, of the B two B market? Because one thing that I also uh, saw is that many B two B uh, merchants, right, or manufacturers or distributors that they're selling B2C as well. So kind of uh, the lines are blurring in certain aspects, right? And, uh, and companies are just seeing other channels and uh, they might not need to change the whole experience. They just need maybe to add a couple of features that are needed, the ones that you were just mentioning for specific needs, right? But the, the business itself, like they're selling the same products to just a larger pool of uh, customers. Mm -hmm. How do you yeah, see the market think, growing in, in that in that in that aspect? Yeah, for the for the B two B merchants that uh, don't really have the desire to go direct to consumer at some point in the future and get that better margin, if it's truly just bring my existing base online because the market's changing, they're demanding these features, they're not going to get as much value. Um, they're going to perceive it as, hey, now I'm just paying fees for yeah. website fees, more fees for payments. I didn't you know, have to pay these fees before and I have all these same customers. So the way to view it is, hey, if I can use this as a vehicle to get a better margin as a, if, if there's no channel conflict, right? Um, you might not be able to sell in certain regions, which you can do, uh, you can restrict product selling in certain regions if you have agreements with certain distributors. But um, don't want to go too far down that road. Yeah. But basically, if you can see it as a way to generate new business, generate more business, or get a better margin on, on business, that's the right way to look at it. If you're looking at it just 
get my existing customers over here because they're asking for it and I want to be with the times, I while that's doable, they're not going to be getting the maximum amount of value out of that because they're basically saying I'm doing this because I have to, not and and not and they're react. It's, it's a reactive approach, right? So yes, the market is very large because a lot of businesses feel that they need to, right? So so naturally they're going to spend money creating the digital presence and doing all of these things because they're getting pressure because their competitors are doing it or they read an article that says, hey, you need to do this uh, or you're going to lose your customers, yeah. right? Um, so so that's why you're going to get just this continued adoption because, because it, it just is, right? But I think where the market is really going to open up is when you have these like manufacturers that are like, wow, like we get good SEO now, we get inquiries from people that we've never even thought we would reach before. And now we can go into new international markets and sell, you know, to all of these mom and pops in a way that's profitable. Because, you know, before it wouldn't make sense for a sales rep to go and, you know, work with. 200 mom and pops that just get like the basic level yeah. of discount. But you know, you can do that now on, and you see enterprise brands not taking their whole enterprise business online again, because a lot of it might still be an EDI and other custom platforms, but they're saying, Hey, we'll create a big commerce site or Shopify site and pick up everything that our reps don't want. Cause our product is okay. great. Right. You know, we know we have a good product and we're just, it's, we're just not that's an interesting angle yeah we're not focused on this market right so this is a net new market for us by by building this out right and and, and yeah. going back to like you brought back the, the sales reps and uh, a common mm -hmm. objection i don't know i can find a maybe a better word for that but a common objection that we uh listen a lot from uh b2b merchants or maybe the, the, you know, the doubts that they're having when, when going online, in many cases, mm -hmm. it's about average order value, right? Because mm -hmm. they know that they get a, 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 a sale on, on the phone and they know there's a sales rep that's going to be constantly, uh, I don't want to use the word upselling, but up value, you know, giving up value and giving more value and increasing that, that order. How do you attack that and knowing that uh, with the, the with the new tools that you're providing, you can personalize the experience more and more. How does that relate? And, and have you heard this objection before as well? So I just want to understand. So the average is the objection that the average order value is lower if they're purchasing online than if they were on the phone exactly. because they can more effectively upsell. Yeah. Exactly. So I mean there are there are tools. This is very difficult, by the way. And this is a this is a challenge that all B2B businesses, whether you're a manufacturer, distributor, or other, are gonna have is on the product data, right? So for a smaller catalog, you can more effectively merchandise because there's just less less information to digest and the 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 tools the personalization tools um they're gonna they're gonna be able to understand better the the user's journey and when you click on product a you're likely to also need products b c etc right so i think a lot of these merchandising tools when they when they're able to more effectively digest large catalogs and then when the b2b brands also are able to provide more attributes Okay. Like for, for a certain product, I take automotive, for example, right? If you know that part A requires part B in order to assemble on vehicle, vehicle oh, yeah, C, yeah. right? Then great. You know, put, you, you can put those two as related products and then the, the upsell or the cross sell, uh, carousels will be down below. So, you know that, or you could say with product options, right? This is another one that's very difficult in b2b so a lot of uh, a lot of distributors uh, they just have the part number right but there might be a set of 20 or 30 it's called bill of materials right yep. 20 or 30 parts that go into building one thing right so so when you're when you're merchandising that online you put all those 20 parts on the same page so you can go and say how many of each you need for your project or you're searching the catalog one by one say okay i found this part i found this part right um so i think uh it's a challenge from a technology perspective to replicate what a sales rep is already 
going to know it from selling this product and having that industry knowledge for years and years and years, especially in more complicated fields. Like, you know, we have some cust customers that are literally building like robots and, you know, doing like, uh, you know, they're selling like hardware machines for welding as well as like the software service that goes for all of the welders to create all of these different things. So it gets pretty complicated and, uh, the more complicated it gets, the harder it is to effectively merchandise the same way that a human would, knowing like what you want to build or what your project is. But there's some cool things like uh, I, I've, I've seen build.com as a reference. They have a projects feature where like if I'm a contractor, yeah. I can go in and like assemble all of the things I need for my project. Then I take that to my sales rep and then the sales rep can upsell from there. Right. So you don't remove that, but maybe, you know, it's a little, instead of like rattling it all off on the phone, a sales rep making notes exactly. on a pad, you can go in and build your project. And then your sales rep says, Oh, here's my project. That's called the hybrid sales model. And I think that's the way, that's the way that we'll see it going. And yeah, that sounds very interesting. And, and, and we, we see that as well, right? Like, uh, we need to help sales rep to work with technology, not against it. Uh, right. And and what about scalability? Because what you're describing seems like very complicated. And once it's set, definitely you cannot forget it. You cannot set it and mm -hmm. forget it. But um, it, w it was the case. It has been the case for many, many years that you put together this robust system of automation, workflows, etc. But you were mm -hmm. like handcuffed to it. Right. But right. you from what I understand, and please explain further, you've kind of worked around that, right? And you're allowing for scalability. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so have you heard like the composable commerce term that, that everybody's kind of yeah. talking about nowadays? So you plug something here, you plug something there. So I think, uh, yeah, microservices, right? So, so big commerce as a platform has always uh, kind of had this message of open SaaS, right? So some things are never going to change. You're going to keep the infrastructure, the updates, you know, kind of in-house. You can't change certain aspects in order to get the scalability of the infrastructure and everything else um, and not having to maintain the server updates, security, all of that. But at the same time, the goal is to have as much coverage as possible for, you know, the data inputs as well as the presentation layers, the storefront, um, so, so what they see. So, so ultimately, I think that allows a business to go completely out of the box from day one. And as they grow, okay, now I'm going to plug in a content management system that can do more personalization, or now I'm going to plug in an advanced search tool that can do AI based recommendations because, you know, I, I'm realizing I need to optimize my search. And then, you know, you, you start plugging in all of these tools, you still have the same backend, right? So, so that's that's one. I mean, that's one way of addressing it is you can plug in other technologies and, you know, as a platform that's supported. Like big commerce is investing in opening up the platform and the ecosystem as much as possible, so that you can get best of breed uh, tools as you grow or bring your own payments solution as opposed to working with, you know, just only like a few that you know the platform says are the ones that that you go with, right? So. Um, I think there are certain sacrifices that will be made by going with a software as a service platform and that you can't customize the back end. Yeah. Right. But I think you do get the scalability in that as the platform invests and grows and the ecosystem grows along with that, you get all of that innovation and kind of uh, added value that could be plugged in um, as your business grows um, as opposed to like, you know, the, 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 ERP focused integration. I don't want to name other platforms that do this, right? But you know, the integration focused solutions, as opposed to like the customer experience focused solutions that can be integrated, right? It's like is the integration as a priority one, and the the extensibility of the front end as priority two, you know, as opposed to the reverse is the the experience as number one, and then hey, there are APIs that will catch up, right? Yeah, it's it's just not. That's the, the gap that you still see today is. But yes, APIs are getting uh, more robust than ever, right? And like exactly. you said, all those microservices working together are putting together. Exactly. It's not a Frankenstein anymore, right? It's, a, it's exactly. functional uh, systems, basically. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. 
So, so that, that, that would be how you would address, you know, the growing of, of your business is through plugging in these different tools and the innovation. And I think big commerce has a great ecosystem. Like there's, there's, I mean, you guys are a part of it, right? There's tons of partners that really understand like mid market enterprise merchants and the growth of a mid market merchant all the way through that progression. Right. I think you see, you know, you see many different stages of growth in big commerce because it starts in SMB. So you could start literally on a 30 a month plan and go all the way up and, you know, I mean, you can pay as much as you want, right? As long as the business is is justified, right? You're doing thousands of orders a day, you know, the, the you know, the infrastructure is going to have to scale to that, right? So, uh, Alec, this is totally maybe unrelated with what we're talking about, but you know what I'm curious about, like, you're this um, musician, like I said before, that work in an agency, and all of a sudden mm -hmm. you're selling your company to one of the big players. Tell mm -hmm. me, tell me that process. Like, how, how was that process? How, how was the day that you that you heard? Okay, big commerce is interested in this solution that we're making. What, what, what was it? Was it an email? Was it a, a meeting? Was it, was it a phone call? How did that happen? I think. Uh, it, it, I think it was just inevitability, right? Okay. Because, uh, <laughs> um, you know, we had we had been building these, we had been pushing big commerce in the direction of B2B since before big commerce realized they could do B2B, right? And we had done that, um, you know, for so long. I think everybody at big commerce kind of knew that <laughs> this was going to be the solution, Right. I think there there were other there were other solutions out there, um, but we were so hyper focused, like we never diversified, right? And you know, talking about as a musician, right? So for me, like, you know, I I uh, am passionate about you know doing you know music, producing, working with other artists, and kind of collaboration. And it was kind of the same type of project, <laughs> which is like, hey, here's this ecosystem of people. Everyone brings something unique to the table. Here's what we do. Become hyper-focused on doing that really well. Just like as a producer, you know, if I can just focus on getting the best out of these different elements, I'll create, you know, something that works for everybody, right? It's the same. It's just understanding, like, the dynamic of the ecosystem, what we can focus on doing that really, really well. And then at the end of the day, you know, merchant success, right? You you can't have like, I think we had a couple of you know one star reviews. I called them as soon as they did that. I said, why why a one star? They're like, oh well, like you didn't respond about this thing. I was like, okay, well, how can we help? Switch it to a five star, right? So your your reputation and your customer service it will go a really long way. You go out of your even if they're only paying you a hundred dollars a month, you you treat them with the same you know deliver. respect and everything that you would someone paying you $10,000 a month. And you really just focus on that. And, and same with the, the agencies, even if they're developing on a project you're really not very excited about, you want to enable that. So now they're, they're promoting you across all of their other new projects. Right. So, um, yeah, you can't, you can't satisfy everybody always, you know, whether it's in the music yeah. industry or it's in the e-commerce industry, but if you just focus on like doing that one thing really well, like I was never, I was never like surprised that big commerce said they wanted to buy us. Um, I think the step you, one you were was, prepared. We were very prepared, yeah. right? Because it was a uh, like inevitability, right? Because yeah. we were doing this for so long, and every single year, big commerce instead of building their own B two B solution, they made the decision to continue with the partner first methodology, which is where we were operating. Yeah. Now that, you know, B2B Ninja, the other, you know, John and his company, you know, they're, they're inside as well as us. It's like these two kind of leading partners over the years. Now we're inside of big commerce, you know, it still should be a partner led strategy, right? But it's going to take us some time to integrate these two solutions into the core. So for the time being, you know, we're, we're looking to kind of take a couple of steps back to take 10 steps forward once we have so we're, we're kind of doing our own like crawl walk run strategy now that hey big commerce we've acquired these two technologies we've acquired all the knowledge and the teams that come along with this um but now we have to rebuild almost the ecosystem of b2b partners around that and that's basically my job 
is to rebuild the B2B portfolio of partners so that what's who's the next bundle B2B and B2B exactly. Ninja, right? That kind of takes takes us into the next category, right? So that's kind of next six months, if I were to look into the crystal ball, it's really understanding like that that new ecosystem of B2B partners that can help propel us into you know, a higher category of the mid market and then higher because we're doing really well in, you know, the higher SMB and the lower to mid tier of mid market. I don't think anybody is addressing those merchants the way that we are. But once you get into the higher uh, tier of mid market and enterprise, you have a lot of other, you know, again, I'm not naming platforms. You have a lot of other platforms out there that are now trying to address that. But what's interesting is these platforms, you know, We'll see if they make it through the recession because yeah. they need funding. <laughs> yeah, big commerce. We're a public company. We have reserves. You know, we can make it another ten years without you know changing too much, right? And a lot of these newer entrants that are kind of you know getting into the RFQs here and there. Um, we'll see how long they can last, right? Um, just because it, we're going through a tough time, right? You've seen what happened with the financial technologies and their valuations and spooking the investors and. It's kind of spilling over into e-commerce as well, you know. So you get to see the layoffs yeah, and well, other things. Yeah, it's, it's no, and the, right the supply chains that are being affected uh, heavily. That right? too. That too, right? So now distributors, you know, they have to pay, you know, two hundred and fifty k to hold an order that yeah. might not get there for six months. Yeah. And so now you've got the banks that are saying, "Hey, well, no, we'll help you." Uh, you know, we'll help you with that, you know, we'll take our percentage and then that's going to drive up the price because now they have to get a loan and pay interest. To oh, fulfill it's an it's, order. it's re relearning how to sell without stock, basically, right? Yeah, yeah, it's, it's but I mean, the, the businesses that actually double down and, and like focus during a recession, like, like for us, like COVID, it wasn't a recession for us, it yeah, was exactly. the opposite. Yeah. But the initial, the initial few months it was because nobody, everything froze for like- if, Everyone was scared. Like who, who wanted Everybody to take the, 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 the first step, right? Yeah, we sat down and we're like, wait a second. I think that we actually have a real role to play to help to help all of these people come out of this better, right? So for those two or three months that everybody was stopping, we were going, you know, 50, 60 hours a week working on the products. We're like, hey, if we can just like get a couple of these things a little bit better, we'll get all of these businesses that are fearful, uh, you know, of not having this presence to kind of come in here and 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 join join our movement basically, yeah. which is hey, you invest now and it'll be worth it later, rather than you know wondering what you should do and then everybody else is coming out of this stronger, which is kind of the same thing, but not for the product companies. Now it's for the technology companies because yeah. now it's happened to us, right? Because we've seen this explosive growth and then now there's this massive correction and it's like okay, well now you guys should really be focusing and doubling down on what you do really well forgetting about all the other stuff and coming out of this stronger. Otherwise, you know, your funding might go away and, you yeah. know, potentially yeah, it's a missed opportunity. You're going to be in a tough spot, right? So. And, and uh, what would you say to those B2B merchants that are just kicking tires that can't make their minds about like going into the e-commerce space because mm. There, there are lots of those, right? What, what would you say? What, what would your advice be for them? Honestly, I would say don't rush into it because <laughs> this is this is like uh, probably the opposite of what you'd think. But don't rush into it because the longer the longer you wait, the more apparent it will be what solution actually makes sense for you, right? And um, but wouldn't you say that say, that you need to test the waters so, and, and exactly. correct and, and and optimize like. Fail fast, right? Exactly. I mean, I think right now, a lot of businesses are realizing that they don't need to develop custom software. Exactly. Right? Yeah. So that's why I say the longer you wait, maybe the better it is for you. Because say you got a trial of Shopify, you got a trial of big commerce B two B, you got a trial of uh, you know, Wix, right? Mm -hmm. So anyone can go and develop a website on Wix, right? So I think there's there's so much that you can find out now just by going and trialing software as a service and looking at what's available out of the box. And then chances are none of that's gonna work for you, right? But you wanna understand, all right, you know, out of the box, can I migrate one customer to this? Can I migrate two customers to this? Okay, now how would it integrate with my back office system? Okay, so, so you see so many buyers that are not educated on what's available 
and they'll listen to a consultant and that consultant will drive them down the custom software yeah. path because Crazy. they already feel that they needed it, right? Because that's how it has been. But the reality is probably they didn't need it. Nobody convinced them otherwise that, hey, you can try this. It costs you nothing to go and try the software that's already available to you. That's the beauty of SaaS, right? And what we were talking about, lowering lowering this barrier to entry, I think, you know, by, by 2023, 2024, you know, the barrier to entry for, for B2B, when you look at iPass, ERP, you know, you'll see the path forward for you. Like if I'm using NetSuite or if I'm using Sage or if I'm using Epicor or if I'm using a lot of these ERP companies now are somewhat paving the way forward. I think me as big commerce, I'm trying to make that easier yeah. for, for these, these companies with iPass and partnerships. So each one of these ecosystems, you kind of have to approach it a little bit differently. But overall, I'd say don't rush into anything custom. Don't rush into anything that you know costs you more than a hundred thousand dollars out of the gate. I would look at you know, I would look at you know just the software as a service first. Figure out how far that has really come since the last time you might have looked at it, and then you're gonna just be way more educated if any if if, if you, even if you still go down the custom route, at least you know what you are yeah. missing out on. <laughs> yeah, but, but, but you know, it, it's it's funny that you mentioned that because we, we see that happening uh, with our customers because we're in the middle, right? We're in the middle connecting NetSuite, you know, ERP, uh, NetSuite ERP customers with solutions such as uh, BigCommerce with Bundle B2B. And what we find is that sometimes uh, B2B merchants and also some many B2C merchants, they tend to overcomplicate what is it that they need, right? And they come with this huge list of requirements. Then when you do the exercise with them, right? And, and that list of requirements definitely is a custom solution. But when you oh, start yeah. shaving uh, and identifying what's the must-haves uh, versus the wish to have, you see that like all of this, it's done natively with big commerce and uh, bundle B2B. So let's just start with that, right? And for the fraction of a cost and a fraction of time, and uh, and they many times they transform for good their companies and their internal processes as well. As long as that's still scalable, exactly. Right? And that's why we were talking about you know the microservices and the ecosystem being so important is because you don't want to bait and switch. You don't want to exactly. get them in and say, hey, look, this looks really good, but then you can't grow out of that, right? So I think that's that's where you know yes, it, to your point, it's so important to. Uh, to phase that out and understand, look, okay, this thing in phase three is pretty far off from what you want today. If we were to develop it, it would be a custom application. Exactly. But these other things in phase one and two are already here. It's going to cost you a third to, to, to go with this. That's your phase one and two. Phase three, that item, yes, if you want to build it today, you pay $150,000, we'll do customization for you. But, you know, and many times phase, th phase three n doesn't even happen because of phase one, phase two, Never like happens. pivot at Never like because yeah. once you get because once you get it live, guess what? Your customers are giving you feedback. Exactly. Your sales reps are giving you feedback. And then suddenly you have something tangible, not just what you think. Well, that's right? it. That's <laughs> a, I, I totally agree with that with you on that. Like, like, that's the agile approach versus the waterfall approach that you go to the market oh. and you just hit a wall. Yeah, I, you, need I, agile. you need agile in, in today's yeah. with how fast things are changing. Like you said, it has to be agile because who knows, like next next year, you've got, you know, B2B multi storefront headless, you know, you've got things like multi location inventory, like stuff that's been on the roadmap for years. And, <laughs> and, and do you <laughs> like finally coming to fruition? Yeah, it's like, wow, they actually have this whole stack now you know, that that works and can be auto. It's crazy. Like, it's and do, do, do you see as well, Alec, because uh, this is, I think, uh, something that happens to many, many companies, many, many CEOs, merchants, owners, that they feel they're unique. They feel that the, the, the problems that they have are absolutely unique. But if they just scratch a little bit on the surface, they're sharing that same problem with many, many other companies. And uh, right. they're not being original with the problems that they're trying to solve. And, most sure someone already solved that problem for someone else. It's just like bringing those solutions. And, and 
I introduce that merchant to the other person I spoke with and, and I have them talk. Exactly. They, <laughs> you don't have to believe me, exactly. right? I'm just a software guy. I work with this other guy. I'm pretty sure he will help you. Like, uh, you know, it, it came up like it's a shipper HQ configuration thing for like shipping zones. Yeah. And this business was really, really frustrated about it. And it is, it is kind of an edge case that they had, but I had recognized, oh, that this, this other business, they also had this edge case. Why don't I connect you to, cause they were thinking about leaving the platform altogether. They said, I don't think this is going to work for us. Alec I said, well, before you do that, why don't you talk to this other merchant that had the same challenge and see if they can, they can help you. Sure enough, he, he provided a workaround solution and they stayed. Yeah. Right. So you know, yeah, I, it's, I it's looking at the it. essence of the problem, not just like the surface. Exactly. Thing. And I love doing that stuff. Right. And I, I love like being able to like be in the weeds and, and, you know, speak with the merchants about the real problems and, and all of that stuff. Right now I'm starting to get more high level, which kind of upsets me. So I like having, <laughs> you want like to go deeper. Yeah. I like being in the trenches, probably a little too much, um, you know, taking the punches, giving them back. <laughs> Man, I, but, that, that's, that's, I, I, I would say that those are growing pains, right? Exactly. So now it's like, okay, you know, I wish I, I wish I knew a merchant that I could connect you with, with this problem. Let me talk to our IPMs or our CSMs or get in the Slack channel, pose this and then see if somebody is like, I won't maybe know myself, but chances are we've probably like, we may have seen this before. Right. <laughs> yeah. I love it. Alec. Yeah. Uh, well, thank you very much. It has been very valuable to, to be speaking with you today. So uh, thank you everyone for joining us today with Alec Berkeley. Uh, Alec, again, it's, it has been an honor to, to have you here. Please remind us, where can people find you? Where can people uh, connect with you? Uh, you can just connect with me on LinkedIn. Um, yeah, just Alec Berkeley. You, I should come up over there. Perfect. <laughs> um, we'll yeah, we'll yeah. share all the, all, the, all the relevant links in the, in the description below. So uh, okay. once again, Great. thank you very much. Uh, for joining us today. That's it for uh, this week's episode. Be sure to subscribe to the channel, follow us on Spotify, all of our socials, and thanks for watching. This is Diego Praderi, and this was The Link. Bye-bye. Great. Thanks.